Hi, and welcome to um, our HOG live stream video today. I'm Dr. Rachel Zabana. I'm one of the pediatricians here at HOG Medical Group Pediatrics at the Foothill Ranch office. And today we're gonna talk about um, my baby's home, now what? What are we gonna do once the baby gets home and we're discharged from the hospital? So um, just a little background about myself. I'm, I've been with HOG Medical Group for the last, um, going on six years. Um, and um, I'm from Orange County, from Huntington Beach. Um, and let's dive into it. So now that the baby's home, congratulations, you're a parent. It's, um, being a parent is a wonderful time. It's supposed to be a good, beautiful experience, but it does come with um, a lot of things that we need to learn and we need to go through in order to make sure that we maximize our wonderful time and we make it as smooth as possible and as productive and um, as memorable as possible. So. I wish all babies came with a manual, <laughs> just like everything else we buy and we have in our lives, but babies don't come with a manual. So I tried to break it down into um, things, the most common things that you're gonna see and what you're gonna be doing for the first, at least for the first year. So the well baby visits. Once you're home from the hospital, we do wanna see the baby back in the first three to five days after discharge. Um, I broke down the visits so you can see in the first year, um, we do see the baby more often. And as you get older, we see you uh, more less frequently. And then by the time you're three years old, we'll see you um, once a year. Uh, the most important thing is the first visit. The first visit is made so we can um, see how you're doing with, the, with breastfeeding, um, if the baby's growing well. We also look at jaundice. Uh, which is the yellowing of the skin that some babies get um, to make sure that we don't um, that we're on the right track. We'll make sure that they're, you're uh, urinating, uh, voiding, stooling, all of that good stuff. The second visit is generally to um, make sure that you've gotten to the point where you have a nice schedule, that you're maximizing your breastfeeding or bottle feeding, whichever one's working, if we need any lactation help, if the baby's growing properly, and so on and so forth. Vaccinations usually start at the two month mark, um, and that's one of the things that we do at those visits. So what happens at each visit in general is we do a physical exam, we talk about general health of the baby and which vaccines we're going to do. And just like I said earlier, we're going to do, uh, we're going to start with the vaccinations at the two month mark. Um, the other thing we talk about is safety. What are the things that are going to come up as the baby grows up? And then uh, we focus on behavior development um, and growth in general. When it comes to growth, we, um, most, most parents will, will notice that the baby will lose weight in the first few days of life. We expect no more than 10% of the birth weight to be lost in the first few days, and then you're supposed to regain that weight within seven to 10 days. Some babies can take up to 14 days, um, but in general, we'd like to see a nice increase in, in weight and hopefully get to birth weight, if not beyond, by the time we get to the two-week mark. The weight in general will triple um, from the birth weight by one year of age, and your length will increase by one and a half times from the birth uh, length by one year of age. On average, babies will grow about um, uh, two, um, two, one to two ounces a day, about a pound um, per, per month or so. When it comes to development, we do wanna talk about it's not just um, feeding, it's also um, babies are listening to everything you're saying. They want to interact with you. They wanna, they want, you want to read to them. You want to engage in every moment that you can. And part of that is motor development. Um, I put that screen out here. It kind of helps you see how the baby grows up in terms of motor skills. If we start on the top left-hand corner, you'll see that the baby's in fetal position. That's when the babies are born. They, generally don't do much except sit in the field position, look at you, move their head around, move their bodies around. As they get older, around um, two months of age, they'll start picking up um, themselves by the shoulder when you put them on their belly. By four months, they'll be able to kind of sit up on their elbows. And then by four months, four or five months, they'll be able to start turning um, to try, try to go from belly to back. And by six months, the opposite. 
six to eight months, they'll try to st sit up on their own. A lot of them will, uh, will do what we call tripod. They try to sit up, but they can't because they're still working on their um, back muscles. So they'll slant forward and, it'll look, and they'll cross their arms to steady themselves. And that looks like a tripod. Um, and some people may not know what that is, but back in the day when we had cameras and we had tripods that they stand on, that's what the tripod was, is, is the three, um, the three legged stand that we used for the cameras. Now we use cell phones, so we don't even use that. Um, and then so on and so forth. The baby starts getting up by one year of age. They should be standing and trying to take a step or two. They may fall by 18 months. They'll have a better, um, better uh, center of gravity and they'll be able to walk a little bit better um, and, go, and we'll go from there. Language is the other part of development that we need to make sure that the baby's um, acquiring on time at two months. They're supposed to be cooing, gurgling. They will also do social smile. If you smile at them, they should smile back. Um, by four to 10 months, we wanna make sure they're starting to develop words, sounds. Um, at four months, they'll do the raspberry noises. By, um, there are some red flags that we have to pay attention to. And, and a lot of those well checks that we have are there to make sure that we catch the red flags, those major, developmental milestones, if they're not met by a certain age, those are red flags and we need to um, get an evaluation right away because um, early intervention is the most important thing. One of those is the nine month visit, even though the nine month visit, um, you may not get any vaccines, sometimes you get catch up vaccines, but the main point of the nine month visit, for example, is to make sure that the baby is babbling, that the baby is hearing you, that, that they are um, actively starting to communicate. Um, if not, then we need to do an evaluation. Um, um, the, the rest of it, I, I only went up to the 12 months, but basically by 12 months of age, they should have at least, at least um, not just the first spoken word, but they should have something other than mama, dada, in whatever form language that, that they um, call mom or refer to mom and dad with, plus one more, one more word, minimum. Not everybody, um, these are the minimum. Some babies and most babies will have a lot more than that. But like I said, we're looking for the bare minimum. We wanna make sure they actually got to that point at least. Um, the more you eat to the baby, the more you expose them to language, the more you allow them to watch your mouth speaking, which is a little difficult these days with the masks on. But I always encourage parents when they're home to try as much as possible to um, have the babies watch them speak. Or when you're doing social media with family, um, let them join you so they can watch people speaking, so they can mimic those sounds and those mouth movements. Um, the, um, how do we get to the best developmental milestones? How do we get to them um, as, as best as we can is nutrition, of course. And the most important thing is the first few hours of life, the first few months of life, we want to feed the baby as much as possible. Um, breastfeeding, of course, exclusive breastfeeding. Exclusive breastfeeding is um, the most ideal, of course, but some, some moms can do it, some moms can't. This is why we have formula if we need to, there's a time and place for that. But in general, we want everybody to uh, do breastfeeding. If you can do the first six months, that would be the most ideal. Um, newborns will feed, yes, multiple times a day, um, up to eight to 12 times a day, which comes out to be about every two to three hours. That's through the night as well. Don't worry too much about having a schedule in the first few days of life or the first week or two of life. That's the point of those uh, first week or so is to bond with the baby and try to um, get um, that bonding going and the baby will, will um, connect with you and they will tell you what they need. The main, the main point or the main um, sentence that I usually tell parents at the first couple of visits is if the baby hasn't asked for food and it's been three hours, wake them on purpose. Usually for the first, first two to three weeks, if not the first month. By that time, the baby will have created their own schedule. They would have um, gotten the point of what they wanna do. They will signal your body. The more you put them on the breast, the more they're gonna signal your body to make more milk to make sure that they are feeding the way that, uh, as much as they need. So 
should I do formula? Should I do breast milk? Of course, best is, uh, breast is best. Um, there are a lot of benefits to breastfeeding, not just for the baby, but also for mom. Um, so for the baby, we know that breastfed babies are less likely to have SIDS. They, they have a decreased risk for that. They are less likely to have diarrhea and to have infections in general. Not, that's not to say that breastfed babies do not get sick. They also get sick, just like everybody else, because we need to um, boost our immune system. We need to um, survive, you know, viruses, bacteria, all of those are everywhere and our body learns every day. Um, but being breastfed decreases your chances of getting those infections or decreases your chance of having the severe form of these infections. If you, for a baby who has diarrhea, breastfed babies tend to recover faster, from, um, less likely to be hospitalized. Um, and in general, that goes along with pretty much all of the, the childhood illnesses. Uh, breastfeeding also optimizes development. It improves cognition. And of course, you have that bonding um, from mom and baby. For mom, it's actually a couple of things. It's emotional emotional benefits as well as physical benefits. When you're breastfeeding, you're more likely to get to pre-pregnancy weight faster. Um, there's also less bleeding time um, and um, you um, overall emotionally, uh, when it's a successful breastfeeding, um, it actually does um, help you produce endorphins and feel better. Um, it's also, of course, economical. It's readily available. You don't have to wash any dishes or prepare any formulas, um, you know, which does take a while. And it, it, you know, I personally like the ready-mades if you have to do that, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can also, uh, um, you can also, when you get to the point where you make enough milk, you can also pump and freeze for a later time because um, I always say moms are not machines. Sometimes they do need their time off. They need, need a break. And also dads and um, uh, mom's partners and family members want to help. Um, it's a nice way to bond with the baby when they're feeding. So, and that also takes some pressure off of mom. So um, pumping, if you can, when you get to that point, uh, will allow you to do that. Breastfeeding, the golden hour for breastfeeding is literally the first hour when you're first born. That's the golden hour we want that bonding to happen between mom and baby, put the baby skin to skin, start. The baby may not latch, they may latch, but the whole point is putting the baby to the breast and allowing them that first chance. Um, it leads to more successful breastfeeding. It um, helps the mom and the baby um, recover from, uh, from the delivery um, in general. It does take time to establish good breastfeeding. I know breastfeeding is natural, but it, just like anything else, you ha do have to work at it a little bit. Um, but the good thing is you're not alone. We have a lot of people around you to help you. So when you're at the hospital and you have the baby, ask the pediatrician, ask the lactation uh, team. There's the nursing staff. They're all highly trained. They all um, have, uh, if not personal experience, they have experience from just working in general. We're all here to support you to get that successful breastfeeding um, moment going. We also have um, here at Hogue Medical, uh, or Hogue, we have the Pacify app, uh, which is a wonderful app. I would highly recommend you activate it as soon as you get it once you uh, leave the hospital. And it is an app on your phone where you get access to lactation help. Uh, I believe it's 24 seven. We also have our lactation team hotline. Um, you can call that as well. Um, and that number, I believe, is 949-764-BABY, uh, baby. Um, you don't have to do it alone. That's what we're here for. We want it to be as uh, comfortable and as successful as possible. Um, a lot of moms who are breastfeeding always wonder, am I making enough milk? Because you can't see it. If you pump, you can see how much. If you give a formula, you can actually see how much you're giving. And a lot of people get really nervous. Am I giving the baby enough? The baby doesn't seem to, to be satisfied. With breastfeeding, babies will tend to eat more often and they will cluster feed at times, especially during the beginning where they're trying to, one is they're trying to signal your body to make more milk because they are, they are learning how much they need. And also their stomachs are expanding from day to day, from time, one time period to the next. So they're gonna have those moments where they're gonna cluster feed to try to make up for what their body needs at that moment. So the answer is always yes, you're making enough for the baby. I mean, there are times when um, 
due to stress, maybe you're recovering from um, an unexpected surgery during, uh, after the delivery or some other condition, some medications you're on, maybe that's not allowing you to make as much milk as you, as you need to, but that's, for most, for most moms, yes, you are making it. It's all about supply and demand. The more you put the baby on the breast, the more you're signaling the body that, yes, I need more, the baby needs more, make more. Stress does have a big um, a part in, um, in breast making. So if you are stressed, just like with anything else, if you're stressed, you're not gonna be at your best. So our goal is to minimize that stress. We want mommy comfortable, so healthy eating, lots of fluids, take your vitamins, rest as much as you can. Babies will, <laughs> they, if they're gonna be waking up every two to three hours, it's hard in the beginning at least to get some sleep so we always try to tell parents as as much as you can try to sleep when the baby's sleeping take some cat naps if you ha if you need to if there's somebody there um, uh, to help you take advantage give them the baby tell them i'll be back in 20 minutes and go take a 20 minute nap um, but definitely you want to hydrate yourself the more you're hydrated the more you're comfortable the more nutrition you have in you the more likely you're going to be able to give the baby all the milk that you need. Um, we, we, of course, with babies, we don't want to give juice or water. We don't need water for at least the first six months of life, but definitely we, we try to avoid juice. But most babies, by the end of the first month, they'll take about three to four ounces every feeding. Um, by six months, they'll take about six ounces. And with breastfeeding, again, it's hard to tell, but babies usually want about four to five good feeds per day. Um, they may want a little more, they may want a little less. Some days they'll eat more, some days they'll eat less. But overall, in general, they will be satisfied. They will tell you, they will let you know if they're, they're gonna cry, they're gonna be mad. They'll let you know that they need some. Um, I put that photo up just to kind of give an idea of, um, am I, again, am I making enough milk? The first day of life, the baby's belly is the size of a cherry. So yes, you make a little bit of colostrum, that's enough that one milliliter of colostrum that you make, that thick, creamy um, milk, that beginning milk, that's actually full of nutrients and full of what the baby needs at that moment. And it fills up that tiny little size of cherry. Um, and as, you, as the baby grows up, the stomach is gonna grow. So by day three, it looks like a walnut. Kudos to whoever had to do this research project and measure the baby's tummies. I, I'm actually impressed. Um, by day seven, the baby's tummy would be like an apricot, apricot, and by one month, it's the size of an egg. But in general, if you look at the baby, the size of the baby's fist is usually the size of their belly um, as the, after, the day, after the first day of life, because their first day of life, their, their tummy is really tiny. Next is, what do I, should I do formula? Should I do breast milk? There is a time and place for formulas is what I tell parents all the time. Um, my biggest thing is some moms can breastfeed real quick. Some moms, they have to work at it. Some moms, it's just not gonna happen, unfortunately. However, our biggest aim is to try our best to make it a successful and a happy breastfeeding bonding moment for mom and baby. And even if you can't breastfeed, you can still put the baby on the breast for what's called non-nutritive sucking, just for that bonding moment with you and the baby. Um, but if you have to use formulas, we do have, um, and as, we, as I'm speaking, I'm sure they're making new ones by the minute, but there are so many different uh, products out there. As they're all good. They're, generally, there's not one better than the other. However, um, you wanna make sure that the formula that you're getting is FDA approved. You wanna make sure it includes the most important Pro, um, most important, por, most important um, nutrients and products that are found in the breast milk. And the nice thing is the companies that are making these uh, formulas, they are always competing with each other to try to make the best. And our, their goal and our goal is always to try to mimic the breast milk as much as possible. So make sure the formula has the DHA, ARA, all of those good nutrients that are important for brain, heart, um, muscle development, eye, uh, eyes, development of the eyes, the skin, all of that. Um, pretty much all the formulas these days are non-GMO, which is um, they're non-genetically modified. Um, most of the formulas these days have probiotics in them, and then the 
the newer ones are coming out with prebiotics as well, which is the substrate that's needed for the probiotics or the healthy bacteria to use in order to uh, perform optimally. So um, I usually tell parents, Pick one whichever, one, whichever one the baby likes, you stick with it. Babies don't like it when you switch too many times. It just doesn't settle well with them. So you have a normal healthy term, full term baby, you pick a healthy term, a, a formula that's for a healthy term baby. You don't need a special formula. You don't need a formula with low iron. You don't need a formula that is uh, super um, hydrolyzed. Those formulas are there for specific purposes, for specific children with specific needs. So in general, whichever formula you, that works for you, you stick with it if you have to use it. And hopefully you won't need to. Um, next. We also recommend that babies get some vitamin D supplements, especially in the first um, six months or so, ideally for the first year, how, but most of the time, the first six months are the most important, especially for purely breastfed babies or exclusively breastfed babies, but also breast uh, formula fed babies uh, when they're not taking, uh, when they're taking less than 30 ounces a day, which usually happens around six months. Um, the reason behind it is we are not exposed to sunlight as much as we used to. We use sunscreen, which blocks the, uh, which blocks the unhealthy rays, but it also blocks our way of absorbing vitamin D optimally. So um, that's one, one reason. We don't, um, we are generally meant to have uh, a little bit of vitamin D from mom and the rest from the sun, but this is our way of supplementing to optimize the amount of vitamin D in the baby. Um, I put out a few um, different types out there. Um, pick one and stick with it. Most of these products have now become, uh, they've now made them to be one drop once a day, which is very nice for, especially for breastfeeding moms. Um, so whenever you get a chance, go for it. There are ones that have probiotics in them. There are ones that are from the same makers that are just probiotics. It depends. If you if the baby has a little bit of um, gas, they're a little cranky, or you just want to add probiotics, go for it. You can do vitamin D with pro probiotics together. But in general, we definitely want that vitamin D. Moms do need to take their own vitamin D as well. Um, and I have heard that, oh, I'm going to increase the amount of vitamin D that I'm taking so I can give more to my baby. Theoretically, that makes sense. But optimally, you can only give a certain amount from your body to the baby, just the way our body mechanism is, um, uh, our body's mechanism works. Um, you can't really go above that threshold. However, optimize your vitamin D uh, intake as well. Again, we don't, we need to be, um, we need to uh, make sure mom is as healthy as possible, you know. The other thing is I usually tell parents, try as much as possible when you're breastfeeding or even bottle feeding. Sit near a window, get some indirect sunlight. Sunlight is extremely important for our sleep cycle, for our mood. It helps us make the natural melatonin, which helps us adjust our cycle, our sleep cycles and the baby's cycle as well. Plus it helps us get a little bit more of that vitamin D. Um, but open the drapes, but no cooking the baby in the sunlight. <laughs> um, Babies cry, babies spit up, babies can have reflux. It's actually, reflux is actually a, a common thing. Most babies will have some degree of reflux. It's totally normal. It's the ones where they're constantly spitting up, throwing up, not gaining weight, very miserable because of the pain from the reflux. That's the one where you, that we need to address and may need medication, may need to change in formula or change in the way we breastfeed, um, things like that. But in general, babies do spit up. It's normal. No, most of the time, a normal amount is about a teaspoonful. And um, sometimes it's because the baby uh, swallowed a little too much air. Sometimes it's just baby likes to spit up. Um, usually that is not a concern. Um, vomiting is different than spitting up. Vomiting is actually forceful. It's uncomfortable. Um, sometimes it's projectile. Sometimes it's, it's, you finish the bottle, you turn around and the baby spits it all up. Um, that's vomiting. Spit ups are tiny. Vomiting is forceful and it's a large amount and the baby's usually uncomfortable and there's, we need to find that reason. Um, there are ways to minimize spit ups. Um, it's one, Avoid sudden movements, sudden noises, bright lights while you're breastfeeding. Avoid interrupting the baby too much from breastfeeding. Um, you want to burp really well. 
when you're switching from breast to breast to help the baby kind of get rid of any gas, or any air that they may have swallowed on the way. Sometimes they're not latching properly and they, they swallow a little bit of air. Same with the bottle even. If, you're, if they're not um, latching properly with the nipple of the bottle, they may swallow air from the sides of their mouth and that can cause them to have a lot of gas or burp and it uh, cause spit ups, I should say. Um, also, holding, getting in the habit of holding it, the baby upright after feeding in general to try to burp them. And also while you're feeding, breastfeeding or bottled, you want to make sure their head's a little bit higher than the rest of their body. Um, and one other way is making sure that the baby's feeding um, smaller amounts more frequently to try to adjust for the amount that, that the baby can handle at one time. Babies who are overfed tend to spit up a lot more. Um, so if you're noticing that the baby's spitting up way too much, try to minimize the, the amount and feed them a little bit sooner, but, or I should say more frequently, but smaller amounts, and that should help also. Now, we've got, we're gonna have pee-pees and poo-poos and all of that wonderful stuff. We're gonna go through a lot of diapers. In general, wet diapers, uh, when it comes to wet diapers, our general rule is day one, one pee. Day two, two pees. Day three, three pees. Day four, four pees. And day five, minimum five. After day five, you wanna, you're want you going to have a minimum of five wet diapers. And this has to do with just wet diapers, just urine, just the voids. Um, and this is just in general. That doesn't mean every baby must have only one. It's a minimum of one for day one and so on. Um, if the baby's not making the minimum, we need to look back and find out, are we feeding the baby enough? Maybe the baby needs more food than we're, than we're giving them. And then with poos, um, the first few days, you're gonna have frequent stools. You're gonna, a lot of them are gonna be black and tarry and sticky. That's the meconium, that's the first um, stools that they make. And then slowly but surely, they're gonna transition. The more they eat, the more they poop, you're gonna start transitioning to the normal uh, yellow, seedy, looser uh, poops. And um, uh, the, the poop can also be green. That's still okay. Breastfed babies tend to poop almost every time they're breastfeeding. Their poo is a looser, yellow. Sometimes it looks like it has seeds in it, almost looks like Dijon mustard. Um, after two months, you may have a decrease in the amount of uh, stools that the babies make per day, but it could be a little bit more amount per diaper. Formula-fed babies, they usually stool more often than breastfed babies, and it is darker and thicker in consistency. The, the red flags, we don't like black poop other than the meconium in the first couple of days. Um, no black poop, no white, as in like the white of my shirt, of my uh, jacket, and no red in the poop. Any of those, those you need to call us right away, which hopefully, but green, yellow, brownish, light brown, those are all normal colors. Sleep. The babies, um, the, in the beginning, all they do is sleep. It feels like all they do is sleep, which is true. They will sleep on average 16 hours a day. Not necessarily together for 16 hours, but with increments. They'll wake up every few hours to feed, but in general, they'll sleep 16 hours out of those 24 hours. Um, and they'll have more naps as the, the younger they are. As they get older, they're gonna, the naps are gonna get shorter, they're gonna be a little bit more awake. At night, they'll, they'll gonna start sleeping a little bit longer between three to five hours. So yes, by the time they're two months, or one and a half, two months, they can sleep up to four hours at night as long as you're making, as long as they're feeding well during the day and making the right amount of poop and peace. As they get older, like by six to 12 months, they're gonna sleep around 12 hours or so, and they're gonna have about two to three naps a day. Um, crying it out and sleep training, a lot of parents do ask me about that. That is fine, however, it's not recommended until they're at least four months of age. Um, and I always tell the parents, you don't have to rush and do it just because everybody else is doing it. If the baby looks like they're already doing it, fine. If the baby, if you start and the, baby's, um, uh, the baby likes it and it works, great. If you have to struggle through it, Stop, take a break, try again when the baby's a little bit older. Babies will tell you, I would go by what the baby's saying, but the most important thing is if we're gonna do those stretches of sleep and sleep training, make sure that they are getting the right amount of food in those 24 hour period, um, usually in the, in the wakeful hours. And then of course, safety when it comes to sleep. The general rule is um, back to sleep, foot to bed. 
we want the babies on their back, swaddled really nicely. And um, uh, I, most people don't even say that anymore, but it's, I, I learned it as back to sleep, foot to bed, as in wrap the baby really well, swaddle them, and then push them back so that their feet are touching the bottom of the crib. You don't have necessarily have to do that, but it kind of minimizes their rolling when they're asleep. Um, but in general, we, we prefer, we, we recommend no, no co-sleeping in the same bed. You can sleep in the same room and that's actually encouraged, especially in the first few months when you're breastfeeding a lot, because um, the baby's right there. You don't have to, it actually helps you sleep in those moments when you are sleeping. So you don't have to get out of bed and run to another room and worry about what's happening to the baby and the baby monitor. In the first few months, you can have them sleep in the room. Um, and uh, the main thing is keeping the room at the right temperature, making sure the baby's crib doesn't have anything in it that could be help, that could cause any sort of uh, choking hazard or um, any hazard whatsoever. So um, swaddling the baby, no pillows, no extra covers, no fluffy anything, no teddy bears, nothing in there. When um, some babies, when they're a little bit older, when you don't have to swaddle them as much, you can do the sleep sacks. Those are beautiful. They're so easy to use. And then with swaddling, you want to make sure you swaddle the baby really, really well and a, a nice tight one with a little bit looser at the hips uh, um, so they can feel, they want to feel that comfort, that, that tightness that they felt when they were in mommy's tummy. They want that. So if you mimic that, that's why babies quiet down a lot. When you grab them and you, you swaddle them and you hold them, they stop crying. They just want that feeling. They want that heartbeat sound. They want that that skin to skin, that warmth, and that general fetal position style. As they get older, of course, they're more mobile and they want to turn around and have fun in bed. So sleep sacks work really well. Car safety is the next one. Um, I, uh, a lot of parents ask me, especially with the rear facing. Yes, we want the rear facing for the, at least the first two years, for the first two years of life. The reason behind that is we need to make sure the baby's neck muscles are not strong enough. If you are sitting forward and you get rear ended, our natural, that's how we get whiplash. Our natural instinct is our body's gonna move forward and our necks are gonna, go forward and back and you get that neck pain. Babies' necks are not that strong yet. Their muscles are not developed enough yet. So if you get rear-ended and you're facing forward, that child's gonna have an injury. So that's why we want them rear-facing. So if somebody rear-ends you, your natural instinct is to go forward and back. But if you're rear-facing, that baby's head is gonna go straight into this car seat comfortably protecting them. So that's the reason for the rear-facing. Um, and of course, it's safer to be in the back seat than the, than the front seat when you get in a car accident. Hopefully nobody will get in any of those car, uh, uh, in any um, accidents, please. Um, once they're two years old, you can flip them and have a forward facing chair. There are some kids who are too tall for the chair or too heavy for the rear facing chair. Um, and I actually have a couple of parents where we're trying to figure that out. Um, if you are 40 inches tall, you can change to forward facing. If you are 40 pounds or more, you can do forward facing. And when you hit two years, you can do forward facing. Um, and then of course you get to the booster seats up and from the fourth year to the 12th year. And then um, once you're eight years and older, and of course the right size in terms of weight um, and height, you can do the seat belts. Um, I placed the website for the C8, uh, for the um, California Highway um, website to look at the latest child safety seats. But in general, you wanna make sure whenever you get a car seat that this car seat is brand new. It has no history of being in a car accident and that it fits the baby's age and weight and that it's not expired. Apparently there is an expiration date on them because the plastic can get too old and crack. If you have a car seat that has been in an accident, that car seat is no longer safe, just like a helmet. If, it's, if you fell and hit your head with the helmet on, you throw that helmet away and grab a new one because that helmet or that car seat in this case may have cracked somewhere, may have been compromised in one way or the other and you don't want to take that chance. And of course, 
one of the other things in terms of keeping the children safe is vaccines. And my patients know I love my vaccines. Vaccines are safe. They are very effective. Please talk to us um, when you're, it would be a good idea to do that even before the baby's born is talk about, have the vaccine talk with everybody in the family, everybody involved with the baby, um, just to get an idea of what, what are the vaccines? Why are we doing them? What's the, and I, I know a lot of people worry about all the side effects and all the ingredients. In general, just as a sentence, vaccines are safe. They've been around for a hundred years, at least at least a hundred years. Um, and I'm talking about the ones that we are commonly using for ch to fight childhood diseases. We have all gotten most of the vaccines that we're giving our children today, and we have gotten the older versions of those vaccines that used to have a lot more side effects. The main side effects, you can, um, as you know, it's um, the baby might cry, they might get mad at us for a couple of hours, or but babies forget fast, so that's a nice thing. They may have a little bit of redness, a little bit of pain at the site, but all of that, in in comparison to them being sick from those diseases, you know, benefits, risks. But talk to us. There's a lot of information out there on the internet. Please talk to us. It's very important. And um, this is just a sample of the first um, 12 months, the vaccines that we give. I know the first thing people do is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh my God, that's a lot of vaccines. But keep in mind each one of those, some of these are, you don't get them separately. Some of these you get combined. So in, you're actually getting about 0.5 milliliters with every injection, which is nothing. It's a drop in the water compared to, if I'm gonna give you amoxicillin for an ear infection, three, four times a day, I'm gonna give you bottles of amoxicillin to take. So think about it, talk to us. There's a reason we do it. There's a reason it's that, that we have it. And most of us have gotten those in the, f before. Um, and speaking about that, we another way we wanna uh, save our children and keep them as safe as possible is childproofing the house and cocooning. Uh, cocooning is one of my favorites. So childproofing, you wanna go around the house, look for things that can be um, uh, dangerous. And, and that changes, the childproofing changes as the baby gets older. So when you have a newborn baby, you know, you wanna make sure that you don't leave the baby's um, uh, cart, uh, you, you don't wanna leave the baby's uh, chair up on the, the counter with the baby in it. You wanna put it on the floor. You don't wanna um, have the baby sit in a, in a uh, high chair when they're ready without the harness, things like that. As they're more mobile and start walking around and of course putting everything in their mouths, you wanna put everything away. You want the child proof, um, door locks, uh, sorry, uh, cabinet uh, locks. You wanna put everything dangerous up high and lock them. Y even nail polish, hide that, <laughs> um, things like that. Do you wanna make sure if you have um, uh, um, stairs in the house that you have the gates up on there and um, kids are very resilient. They'll find a way to get around it, but you know, just make sure that they are. And then in terms of cocooning, you wanna make sure that the people that are around the baby that are gonna be helping you take care of the baby or just being around there in general, that they are up to date on their vaccines, that they are you know, um, uh, free of any illnesses at the time when they're sitting with the baby. And I know, especially these days with COVID being around, um, it's, it, is a lot, it, it is a little hard on parents because you're not getting as much help as you would have with everybody coming and visiting pre-COVID. Everybody's uh, used to wanna come and help out, but nowadays we're trying to minimize the exposure of everybody to each other to try to minimize getting that infection. So please talk about the COVID vaccine. Talk to, to um, your family members about making sure if they are gonna visit, limit the number of visitors, limit the number of people at one, uh, that are coming in at one time. You know, grandparents are very important. Um, for us and, and to the babies and just in general, they've been waiting for that grandchild forever. So they wanna be part of it. So make sure they are up to date on their vaccines for their age, not just because of the baby, but for themselves. Make sure that, um, you know, hand washing, um, um, mask wearing, if you have to. Um, I generally tell people, even pre-COVID, if somebody wants to kiss the brand new newborn baby, 
uh, maybe not, but if they absolutely want to, maybe pick, kiss the feet as far away from the face as possible because at that age, the baby can't put her feet in their mouth. But in general, things like that, you want to try and make sure that you're surrounding the baby with healthy people and that the more we vaccinate ourselves, the more we protect the baby. And again, um, I'm probably going to say it one more time, but vaccinating the mom who is breastfeeding is a great way to protect the baby as well because the, um, the, what we think is that you're passing along those antibodies that you're making against um, those um, vaccines that are created because of those vaccines you're passing on to the baby. Um, and of course, what, when do I call the doctor? Most of the time the call is because either the baby has fever or the baby is, um, has pain. When it comes to fevers, there's a difference between warm or f and fever. So how do I know if the baby is just warm and how do I know the baby has a fever? So fever is a temperature in a baby, a temperature of 100.4 or higher. If, you're, if the baby looks comfortable and they're sleeping and they feel warm and you take their temperature and if it's 100.4, um, take, uh, take their, unwrap them, wait a few, a minute or so, and take the temperature again. If the temperature has come back down to normal, which is about n between 97 to 98.9 is the norm, um, then that's, that baby was too warm. The baby was overcovered, uh, overwrapped, the, the room is too hot, um, you know, things, or you have the heater on for too high. So that's easy, you change the environment. Um, if the baby truly still has 100.4 or 101 and the baby is sniffling, coughing, does not look comfortable, you let us know right away, especially for babies less two months or less. We need to know why. Don't get, we don't recommend any Tylenol for a baby that has not been vaccinated two months or younger. We need to know why. Um, and also addressing the baby, the general rule is if you're warm, they're warm. If you're cold, you're cold. If you're sitting around and it's hot outside and you're wearing a t-shirt, like, like a tube top, let's say, um, then it's very warm. The baby should not have three covers on it, um, on him or her. If, the, if outside it's freezing and you're sitting there with a thick coat and you're shivering, the baby's gonna need more covers than what you have on. So usually, generally, it's whatever covers you have, you put on the baby. When it's cold, you add one more layer on the baby. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for listening. So let's see, what kind of questions do we have? When do you start tummy time? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, you can theoretically start any time, um, but generally um, tummy time actually helps for a lot of things. One is if you're trying to burp the baby and they're you can't do it, the baby's uncomfortable. Sometimes putting them on their belly, it will help you burp them better. They, some babies also still like to do that um, tummy time and th they feel that um, they wanna do that fetal position on their belly, they like that. When they're newborns, you can, especially if when, when you're hugging them, I know, please don't sleep with them on your, on your chest, but sometimes it, um, it really feels good to have them skin to skin while you're sleeping. That's basically tummy time. Um, but when they're that young, it's usually like a minute or so. When they're a bit older, you can start um, about two months or so you can. The idea also behind the tummy time is to get the pressure off of their, their head. I know because we, uh, have everybody do tummy time. Um, most babies end up with a little bit of a flatness in, their, in the back of their head. Uh, putting them on tummy time will help relieve that pressure and allows the, um, the head to remold properly. So, you know, a minute or two, whenever you want. It's, it's kind of, I, I like tummy times, but of course, please, please, please don't let them sleep that way. Um, next question is, what if the baby throws up when they are sleeping on their back? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, most babies when they're sleeping, they really are not sleeping with their face, with, with their face straight up in the air. Most babies will sleep uh, with their head on the side one way or the other. Um, so if, he, if they do throw up, most babies will throw up with their head sideways, so it does come out. Um, if you ever see a baby uh, spitting up, the quickest way is to put them on their side real quick and let them finish the, the spit up and then um, uh, um, pick them up and clean it up. But, um, but yes, most of the time, if actually not most of the time, babies don't sleep with their face straight up. They sleep on the side, so if they throw up, they're gonna throw up sideways. Um, and generally, if they're gonna spit up, 
or throw up, they're usually going to cry about it, so you'll know about it. Um, but having the um, uh, baby monitor at, in the room helps too, so you can hear them if that happens. And that's about it. So thank you so much for being here today and thank you for the wonderful questions. This is my information. I'm um, Dr. Rachel Zabana, like banana. Um, if you come to the office, you'll see I always wear a little banana tag on my, uh, on my outfit. And I am in the Foothill Ranch office. We hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful night.